Hey guys, Ben Ostervelt here with the Business From Within podcast. Hey guys, Ben here. Tim Larkin blew me away. This conversation we had was incredible. It has so many layers in it. It just kept on getting better and better. We started for the first bit. We start talking about his book, When Violence is the Answer, how it came to, how his publisher was not really into the title, how, how he's affected people's lives, the stories that he tells about how he has taught people how to take care of themselves in an attack. In, 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 in when someone gets jumped in a parking lot. There's so many stories he brings, it's so cool. But then we went into you know, the Vegas shooting and how his wife was the captain and he was sitting there right from the beginning listening to it on his, on his wife's police scanner. Also talked about business and talked about the long game and what it takes, the stories of his military uh, training and, it, and, and how his whole life was flipped right upside down because of a simple injury to his ear when he was going to be the top seal. This is an amazing episode. Enjoy, guys. You're going to love it. Here's Tim Larkin in our conversation. I think uh, growing up, violence was something that we always avoided, right, as kids. Right. And it was right. like, and I think that's what your, your book is trying to accomplish, you're trying to accomplish, is to shift the thinking around violence. Is that, yeah, is well, that right? Well, there's, there's two things that the... The term everybody's comfortable with um, is fight, you know, fight or fight. They, they wanted me to say like fight for your life or, or something. Yeah. You know, like that. yeah. The problem with fight is it, it's, it's too vague a term. Um, mm. You know, you can fight with a coworker, you can fight with your wife, you can fight with your kids, your friends. And that's not the same as, you know, what, you know, when somebody says violence, you recognize that something, there's been a physical altercation. Mm -hmm. And somebody's tried to force their will one way or the other using, you know, bodily harm. So it's a very clear term. And, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's also polarizing. And I think that's not, yeah. that's not a bad thing. I think there's so much gray, you know, I think it stands out. It, it's definitely, I love the title, but I'm a little polarizing sometimes too. So I'll be on that side of the fence. But can I ask you a question? I think, I think um, what would be really cool is right out of the gate here, could you tell me when violence is the answer? And maybe a story of maybe someone that's actually, you know, through your training and what you do, maybe someone that actually has uh, had a massive impact on your training, maybe save their life or something. Love to hear a story. Yeah, absolutely. So violence is basically the answer. The, the, the real delineation when it comes down to everything is do I have choice? And if, if we ever have choice in a situation, if you ever have to ask yourself, hey, is this the time? It's not the time. You, you won't have a question when it is the time to use violence. A lot of what uh, people hesitate on is the idea of, um, uh, the idea of, of uh, you know, legal, the legal issues and prosecutions, sure. which I totally understand. Yeah. But when you clearly define that narrow window, and you know, the one we use is you're absolutely devoid of choice. Meaning if you had an ability to use an exit, you would have gone. If you had the ability to uh, talk your way out of it, you would have done that. Um, and then the threat level is such that if you had a firearm on you, you would feel completely justified in emptying the firearm to that threat or threats. Mm. And so that's the threshold where, where violence would ever be the correct answer. And, and that's, that's where uh, it, it makes it very easy. It's really funny in the U S or in U S and I would say like Western Europe when I train in those areas, I do get a lot of the hesitation at first because of course everybody's so indoctrinated to the legal aspects of things. Yeah. Um, when I clearly define it like this, people completely understand. Okay. Meaning it basically, essentially if you're not going to take action, you're essentially going to participate in your own murder. Um, mm. you know, because, because that's what you're facing, you're facing imminent grievous bodily harm and you, you, you have no alternative, no exits. So um, give a, give a story, give us like, that makes so much sense. Like, I don't think anyone would disagree with that. You know, like yeah. if you're going to, you're about to die, you do whatever you can. Like, is, yeah, that's the, that's the beauty of it. You know, I've, 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 when I explain myself to, uh, you know, I've had pacifist groups, I've had, uh, you know, mm. uh, religious groups I I have a lot of people that, that are there and, and they're okay with that definition. They're completely, yeah. 
fine with it. You know, that, that's the funny part about it is that the title is provocative, but the assumption is out of the gate at times, like I'm going to promote violence. Totally. Actually, You're going to teach people how to beat everyone up. Yeah. 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 And that's exactly it. And, and, and what people are surprised when they hear the full explanation that, Oh no, it's actually the same sober approach. And he's clearly identifying that the one time when, yeah, we'd have to be able to protect ourselves. And then, and then the question is, once you define that, you go, okay, geez, how the hell do I do that? You know, I mean, yeah. that's, that's the big question people have because most people have nothing. In the it's toolbox fascinating. As I, was, as I was getting to know you, uh, I was referred to you obviously, and I didn't, we don't know each other. And I spent a bit of time, uh, you know, looking into you and hearing you speak on podcasts and, and uh, it, it just makes so much sense. You just want to lean in. You're like, man, I, I want to know everything, everything that you know. Like if I got attacked, or I got kids and like just to know, know what to do in those situations. I feel like it's a huge, uh, huge place for this world. I told my wife I was going to chat with you and she's like, I want to come talk to him. Like it's, it, it's because this whole, this whole thing about safety and it, you feel safe. I, I, I can imagine how you, you install confidence into people. Do you find that people become way more confident with the knowledge? Yeah, well, you know, it, that's the beauty of it. Uh, so I had a woman, I had a woman, I talk about her in the book, and she had, she came to us already having experienced violence. Um, and the training itself, she did one of my two-day seminars, and the training itself cool. was tough. It was tough for her. She had to take herself off the mats a couple of times. She was just kind of reliving what had happened to her. Oh, wow. So Which, it, it was tough because of an experience she had, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, so, and that's what I tell So the reason I wrote the wow. book, just as a quick sideline, the reason I've written this book is the people that actually come and train with me are usually, you know, uh, fine. If you, it, like if your listeners don't know who I am, that's probably a really good thing. Because the people that do seek me out, usually mm. 70% of my clientele, violence has already entered their life. You know, and so they're looking for ways to minimize the chances of that ever happening again, probably work out a little bit of what happened and why it happened. She was one of those people that, that came. Her husband brought her. She was a little bit nervous. Um, so we worked with her the whole time. Um, what was interesting was, well, it's horrible, but of course, she's the one of that class that I think it was about, about a year or six, six months to a year later, she contacts us. Her husband actually contacted us, and he sent us the police report. And what had happened, she had gone to a Home Depot. She was getting stuff for her garden. She has a therapy dog, which is a German Shepherd. And um, she had just put her therapy dog into the cage. Now, it's not an attack dog, but it's still a German Shepherd. You know? Yeah. As soon as she clicked the cage closed, wow. she, heard, she heard from behind her, can I help you? Do you need help? Jeez. And she said, the hair went up in the back. And she goes, she said, everything screamed at me. It's happening again. Hmm. And sure enough, this guy literally lifts her up off her, off her feet, you know, does a bear hug, pulls her up. He has a, uh, a van waiting for her, you know, an open van. It's your classic situation. And he goes to lift her. The way he lifted her, he left one of her arms free. She said her first thought was, I can't get to my gun because she was a concealed carry uh, person. She goes, there's no way I can get to my gun. Uh, and we had always instilled in our people that if it's not in your hand, it's not your first weapon. And so she immediately said, oh, wait a minute, I can move. She knew she had access to be able to use her elbow. And she was able to elbow him into the side of the neck. When you strike the side of the neck, there's, there's a vein and artery and two nerves. Mm -hmm. And you're either going to interrupt blood flow, cause a concussion, um, it, which you'll either get a basal vagal effect where people almost like kind of like go to sleep a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, or you'll get knocked out right away, which is like electrical, you know, just a, 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 you're, you're on or you're off. She hits him in the side of the neck. He goes in the basal vagal. He starts to kind of faint, go back, let's go of her. As he's leaning back, the second area of the body she saw was his knee. And she was able to stomp on the knee, you know, wrecking the cartilage, you know, flamingoing the knee, basically just wow. turning it back. And he's on the ground. And, and she could tell at that point when he hit the ground, he was screaming, holding his knee. She knew, oh, okay, he's done. He's done. At that point, he was able. She was able to do that. She said the big difference was this time, it was, it was like we were in her ear. You know, mm. we knew she knew exactly what her situation was. She had something in the toolbox to deal with this, and the reason she was able to do it was because we assume when we train somebody that they're going to face a threat that's bigger, faster, and stronger. This guy was all of those things. 
Um, we assume they're going to carry weapons. He didn't have a weapon on him, but he did in his van. He had wow. a lot of stuff in the van. Um, was he on his own? Pardon? He was on his own then? He was on his own. The van was running. When they played back the, uh, the CCTV footage of, yeah. of the thing, he had been cruising around waiting. Jeez. He saw her. He saw her loading up. He pulled right in, left the, the sliding door open, and was completely ready to take her to a secondary area. Um, but she said the difference was the fact that she literally started immediately thinking what was available to her and how she could do something. And that's our whole thing. We, we're not, when we train somebody to use the tool of violence, we're not training them to compete. We're not training them to, uh, um, win a fight or something. Win a fight or anything like that. What we're doing yeah. is we're saying, Hey, a predator made the mistake of bringing themselves close to you because they don't think you are a threat. And now because of the training that we're able to give you, you know how to exploit those opportunities and, you know, injure, injure the human body in a very effective manner that regardless of the person's size, strength, or athletic ability, they're still going to have to respond to the trauma. And that's what she was able to do. Um, now, if we put both of those people, if we put her in the ring against this guy, and everybody knew it was going to happen, it would have turned out very differently. You know, it's unexpected. There's no way that he's thinking that she's going to do anything like that. Exactly. Exactly. So what's the normal kick and scream? Is that, is that, is that what they're expecting? Yeah. They're kick and scream or, Oh, please, no, please, no. And then they can handle all that because that's, that's an accepted response. They know how to handle mm -hmm. that, how to calm them down, get them in. And, and this guy had done it multiple times. Oh, I'm sure he, he, he had done these things. So, so, so did, yeah, let me, so, let me ask you a question then is maybe a little bit, challenging did she did she attract that you know it's you know what i mean it's got to be like that's a second time and i'm with yeah. all respect in the world if she ever sees this it's all respect but it's a it's a question like do we put a target on her back do women put a target well i think i think what happens with people is we get complacent um you know i call it sleeping with your head on the railroad track and what i mean is we get so used to it, it's convenient for us to do that and therefore, it was okay last time. It's been okay the last 10 times mm -hmm. I've done this. And then, you know, you have a situation like her situation where, hey, the train came, you know. And, and you know, I would, my goal is, is to get people to remove their head from that railroad track mm -hmm. and sleep somewhere else. And that way they don't have to worry about whether or not the train comes. And do you, and, do you and, sorry, and so, go ahead. No, no. And that's just the idea behind it. It's, it's, I want to minimize the chance of violence ever entering their life. For sure. Yeah. So, so if you were to give some tips, just some real easy tips verbally, like what would someone need to do to, to be uh, in a safer place in their life? Like how can they not put themselves in a situation like that? Do you have any little bit of advice for that? Just an yeah. easy takeaway? Yeah. Let me just explain the, um, I'm, what I'm going to say, people are going to go, yeah, yeah, I've probably heard that before. That there's a twofold way to put this information out. I, I'm all about prevention. What I do though is, is I also have to make sure that my clients physically train. And the reason they have to physically train is not from a athletic st stability or anything like that. You need to, you need to install in yourself what it actually will take if you ignore mm. all the basics and you find yourself in a situation, here's what you're going to have to do to another human being, you know, to be able to survive it. And oh, by the way, once that train starts, you have no idea where it's going to end up. You know, you can't just, control you know what amount of trauma is going to happen in a situation like that once you once you have to physically take action on somebody and that that is what sinks in the change so when i say something to everybody like these smartphones are literally killing us and mm. why are they killing us they are capturing one to two sensory systems on us in a public area where we walk around and we profile as a, as an easy target, as an easy victim. Why? Because we have given up, you know, our sensory awareness basically by, by these phones. I have a great video of a bus attack, uh, a bus robbery in Seattle. And is that on your website? Tim? Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's on my website. I'll, if, you know if, what? I'll send you, you, I'll send you a link. So send you me the link. I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. It's great. It's a, it's a great thing. And if I told people this, I remember when I showed it in my Google talk, they were blown away. It was perfect to do it at Google too, because th those guys oh, are yeah. great people, but <laughs> ultimate techies, you know? Oh, that's and great. They were shocked. We're, you're, there's a guy literally walking with an automatic, you know, just an automatic pistol, and he's walking down the middle of the bus. He's stealing people's iPhones and, and watches and wallets and stuff like that. Nobody's talking to anybody. 
he cuts right into this one kid who's got his earbuds in. He's watching the video. Gun comes right over the phone, <laughs> right in his face. Crazy. And he's like, Whoa. What the, the best heck? part? The best part is he makes a really good move. He actually redirects the vector of the gun. He he penetrates towards the guy, which is a really he just instantly good way did that. Yeah, he saw he solved the vector problem. He then has his phone in the other hand, and you think, great, because you see the phone kind of come up, and you say to yourself, oh, good, he's going to use it as a bludgeon. He's going to, you know, that's great. He's going to do it. No, what does he do? He takes it. He has an overcoat on. He's shoving it into his pocket. Wow. Saving his phone. Meaning he's, threat, he's staring down a gun that mm. a guy has that he, you can only assume that Crazy. the guy probably would use it. But these things have taken over our – our uh, personality so much that we want to protect the phone. We don't want to crack Jeez. the screen, you know, <laughs> and, uh, hey. it worked out. It worked out. Okay. They were wow. able to swarm the guy and get on top of him. Yeah. But people were absolutely blown away, you know, that, that, that's it. So those, that, that's one of the biggest things that we're doing. The other thing that we're doing um, oftentimes is I, I see people all the time making, uh, wishing the world was a certain way and mm. being extremely, annoyed that it's not. And what do I mean by that? I have a lot of female clients that say, you know, I should be able to jog at 1030 at night with my earphones on and not have to worry about things. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, you should, you, you know, in a perfect world, you should, um, you know, I should be able to, uh, I should be able to, you know, leave my doors unlocked at night. People shouldn't steal, you know, my car or invade my, my, my home or something. But yeah, you know, unfortunately I'm going to, I'm going to have to deal with reality. Reality is, Hey, it's much smarter for me to lock the doors, have a system in place and just take care of that. And the reason we do those things is because it actually gives us a greater peace of mind and a better chance of avoiding violence. And, and so the idea is, um, you know, I tell people all the time, being aware of the potentiality for violence does not make you paranoid. If anything, what it does is you, you make, decisions based on the chance that you know what it's going to take me an extra 20 minutes to get where i need to get but i'm just not going to go this way i know i know potential risks are there i'm going to get up you know 20 minutes earlier in the morning than go to the atm at 10 o'clock tonight i've got mm -hmm. great video i got a video of an older couple going to an atm and it's you know i i played this not only for my customers but i played it for a lot of the guys in my industry and what's really funny is when, when you let people watch it, they say, oh, well, the, the wife approached the, the ATM first and she, you know, uh, she was focused on that. The husband really screwed up. Now, he's an older guy he, yeah. and he had a limp, you know, <laughs> uh, he just wasn't in great shape. You tell, well, he should have been facing the other way for situational awareness and blah, blah, blah. All that's good information. That's great. Don't think it really would have made a difference with the way the attack went down. It's pretty brutal. Three guys came running in, um, and it was just an awful attack on these people. Really? Um, but what nobody noticed was the time code. And so then I pointed out later to everybody, hey, did anybody notice the time code? And they're like, well, no. I go, well, look, it's it's 22, you know, it's a military time, so it was 2250. I go, that's 1050 at night. I said, like, why what, are was, there at 11 what yeah. was so important? I'll tell you what happened. They've been doing it for quite some time. They've been getting away with it. And they probably yeah. think it's their right, you know, to, that I should be able to go get money out of the ATM this night rather than saying, you know what, I'm going to get up 20 minutes early in the morning and do it. it it's things like that. So when people it's, go it through the training so, so or read my subtle. book, it, it's the, my greatest reward is when people tell me about behavior modifications. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the biggest thing because, you know, my, my goal is to minimize the chance of violence ever coming in your life. You know, uh, yeah. a friend of mine in the industry, a guy named Tony Blower, he, he's uh he told me a story that I've always, I've always, I think it's probably one of the best, the, the best observations of what most people want when it comes to self-protection and self-defense. He was kind of tired. He had been training for a whole weekend. He really didn't want to talk to anybody. And this woman engaged him in, in, in uh, conversation. She found out he did self-defense. And of course she lit up and she just yeah. said, Oh, I've always wanted to do self-defense. I just wanted to. And Tony just, he just wasn't hearing it that night. And he, he said, yeah, I kind of snapped at her, but I, I recovered. <laughs> but I told her, I go, no, you don't. Yeah. You don't want to learn self-defense. Yeah. And she goes, of course I do. Right? No. He goes, no. He goes, if you wanted to, you'd be like me or some of my other guys where it would be part of you. You'd be doing this all the time. 
He said, so you really don't want to learn self-defense and how to, you know, quote unquote, take care of yourself. He goes, what you do want to learn, I bet, is how to live a life that minimizes the chance that you'd ever need self-defense. And he said, I can really help you with that. And, and that's nice. really what I think most people want. In order to get there, though, you have to understand the tool of violence. You have to understand how it works and you have to understand how you can use it. And the cool part about it is that's available to everybody. Yeah. And, and that's just, you know, that's, that's great. And we're all hardwired to already be pretty good at this stuff. Just not in the ways that we imagine. We imagine something like the UFC. Totally. Um, you know, these amazing athletes that are just going at it, you know, and when we look at that and we say, well, I could never achieve that. Therefore, there's no reason for me to learn. Yeah, it takes too long or a huge commitment. Yeah. yeah, these are huge, huge uh, mental uh, barriers for people for sure. Right. And, and those are the things where I then point out, well, you know, the best people in the world at doing grievous bodily harm to each other using their bodies and improvised weapons have literally zero training in combat sports and martial arts. Um, they all reside in the prison system. You know, they're, they're there, but they don't have any training. They don't have formal training for the most part. What they do have is they have boatloads of intent, intent mm -hmm. to do harm. Yeah. And that's something that I, that I work with my clients. I, I said, what I want to be able to do is not turn you into a criminal or a sociopath or any of those. But what I want you to do is I want to put you on par with the best, the, the worst of the worst. Meaning, you know, if they're going to go to use violence, I want to put you at a 50-50 with them. Um, and that's the best any of us can do because in a violent encounter, it's usually the first person that gets an injury on the other person that ends up winning the, uh, the encounter. And um, the interesting part about that is when you focus on injury to the human body, it bypasses athleticism. It bypasses bigger, faster, stronger. And, and to really s send that home is the last time I looked at the UFC rules, there were 31 of the rules. 27 of those rules were you know, eliminating the injury to the human body. So what, they, what it was doing was it was eliminating the direct path to ending the competition. Yeah, but too quick. Unfair. Yeah, 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 and it's unfair. And there's no, there is no, um, you know, I want to be very clear with this. I'm in Vegas. Uh, a lot of my friends are involved in the UFC. I have a lot of, I know a lot of fighters. They're amazing individuals. There's no place in, in um, competition for violence at like all. Eye gouging and it's just yeah, not allowed. Not, yeah, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not, a sport. It's, so it's to make it, they want to make it even. Yeah. Yeah. And, but it, it, but the, the flip side of that is the problem is, is when people try to use competition-based approach to somebody who's just using violence. Yeah, like put up your That's dukes. where it can get really <laughs> dicey. Yeah, that, that's where it can get dicey. And um, so when I work a little, you know, one of the, the, it's great to work with a highly capable MMA practitioner or something like that. They're really easy to work with. They usually got great intent. They're, they're very good at what they do. And I just have to tweak them a little bit and show them, mm -hmm. hey, that competition move that you use for submission, yeah. let me show you how to turn that into a joint break to protect you on the street. And you learned, um, you've learned a lot. Uh, I was reading about how you study sports in the breaks. I thought that was fascinating how it makes so much sense as you, you watch how a break happens on the field or, or on the ice. And, yeah. and you actually study that to find out what's the easiest way to do that. Is that, is that right? Yeah, well, the, the, the best data for us, and, and again – I, you know, I'm a big believer in um, you doing, everybody doing their own, you know, validation and research because it's going to be your life on the line. But the reason we use sports injury data, and this started out with when we were with the, you know, originally with, this originally came from the U.S. military, um, the approach that, you know, we have to self-protection that I use. Yeah. Um, when we did that, the docs that we were working with, sports medicine doctors, provided us a wealth of information on sports injury data. And the reason we looked at that was because those injuries all come from humans colliding with humans and humans colliding with the planet. And those are forces that we can replicate. We can, we can absolutely do that. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of injury data, um, you know, sometimes I've seen it in other like, you know, martial arts books and stuff. And the film that they're showing, the injury that they're showing is from like a car crash, something that, you know, yeah, you can't replicate where it that. breaks the feet. We can't replicate that. Yeah, you know, and and, uh, and that's uh, that's just that that's where so it's not as good as people hard, Yeah, they have a hard time understanding, you know, the idea behind, you know, injury data and why would we look at that. The reason we look at that is because it's universal on all humans. 
And especially, you know, when you see like say a great MMA competition where these two just just amazing athletes oh, are better yeah. at it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden something happens. Some some a mistake's made to where somebody gets truly injured. They roll yeah. up on yeah. somebody's ankle or something. Yeah. What do you yeah. see right away? Everything gets shut down right Done. away. That guy who was completely focused on winning the competition, now the only thing you can think about is that injury. And and you know, it's it's over. Um for us, that's where it begins. You know, violence violence begins where the first injury, you know, sets basically. It changes the rules, right? You yeah. you're you, you just completely have an advantage. So can I ask you a couple of things? Um on business from within our podcast here, uh there's so much about uh, interviewing amazing people, but there's always a, in, a little bit more interest too in who these people really are and, and how they think. And, and I feel like a, I feel like true connection comes from getting to know Tim. Uh, what yeah. you do is, is amazing. Like it really is. I think it's uh, I'm going to be uh, following you and I'll be a, uh, uh, it's some, I was even thinking I, I do a lot of conferences and speaking engagements and things like that. I might have to, might have to do something together. I work with a lot of real estate agents. I thought, man, that'd be kind of cool to bring a, bring you in for a conference on real estate agents because that's a yeah. that's such a hot topic for women showing properties i think we can meet you're, you can you're, work, yeah, work your, indus- your industry is just I, i've done a couple of presentations awesome for the real estate industry and i had no idea how much of a problem that is oh my goodness people are putting themselves in like i was coaching one girl and she's like there's this guy that wants to meet me and she says come down to the basement and she was i was so scared i was like holy she called me wow. i'm like i said i said get out of there now like get out of oh, there. Yeah. She, and and so she was a pretty tough girl she got out of there she but she put herself in a really dangerous situation anyways me and you we can talk sometime but i think that uh, there could be a fit but so here's here's a couple of things i was thinking your dad right yeah how many kids you got so my oldest is 23 and um I, then i have uh, with with my wife uh my current wife we have uh to three more i have got a seven-year-old boy and i've got twin daughters that are four that's so cool wow so let me ask you this like you're a dad and you teach self-defense you've seen the scariest stuff ever uh like what do you tell your kids like are you are you training them like how how could you affect those kids like i'm I'm thinking you're obviously bringing this up to keep them safe or like what's that conversation like so my wife my wife is a captain with las vegas metro and uh, she's That's really, cool. she's really accomplished and, and uh, very comfortable, obviously, with training and everything. Um, she was a multi-level black belt martial artist. You know, Does she ever want to fight you? I just want to know. Do you guys ever like? If, <laughs> she's, I tell people all the time. I said I she's, never imagined. I, I never imagined it. being married to somebody that's <laughs> going to roll around better armed than me, better yeah. ready to go. I mean, she's the it's one just, to watch out for. It's almost cliche that you have that you you guys are in that relationship. So that's. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's, it's probably the one person you might be scared of, you know? Like. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. She's, she's legit. She's legit that way. But what's great about it is, you know, the one thing that I do have that I know has been a problem with some, um, some marriages is uh, she's all, all, all also seen, you know, some horrible stuff. Oh, sure. And, uh, and yeah. of course she, she deals a lot here in Vegas with a lot of the sexual trafficking and um, wow. there's, there's just some horrible human trafficking stuff that goes on here. Um, Brutal. But we're both very realistic too that, you know, the sad truth, and I wrote a blog post a couple of years ago about this. Um, kids, I, I get them aware. I want them to, uh, it, it, and it's very important who your instructor is. Make sure that mm. it's not so much the combat sport or, or martial art that you get. It's really all about the instructor. Are they good with kids? You know, do they get no them? Doubt. No doubt. No doubt. Like I have the kids all doing gymnastics first because gymnastics for me is uh, something that the, the people I've trained over the years that have been able to adapt quickest to movement and, and use it effectively, they've either been trained in, formally in dance or gymnastics. They just have a, they have a really good sense of their body and, wow. and it's really good. So that's been helpful. Then I'm probably going to get them in. We have a very good Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, instructor. Um, out here who's great with kids and I think that's a good starting point I have no illusion that this in any way shape or form at, at the ages especially they're at that this is going to provide them any sort of protection from these yeah. predators these yeah. predators are there's so much it, mentally they're so much more developed they've done numerous studies where they've had kids go out give them a training for a day stranger danger all that other stuff yeah then they let the kids go out they do a simulated red team where where guys pose as predators they lose every time right every time i know i saw some stuff it's like it's i got five kids man it just absolutely goes are you are you kidding me yeah 
Yeah, and, you know, and so I tell the parents all the time, but listen, it doesn't mean we have to be helicopter parents. Totally. But, you know, I think the, you know, the, I think the, the line I used in my blog post is something clever, like, does the mother lioness expect the cub to fight the hyena? And, and, and no, it's not. You know, even a, lion, a lion cub doesn't do that. That's our job. Our job that's, is to make sure that we realize where it's at. And, and, hey, listen, it's horrible, man. I mean, I know the things that can happen. I know how tough it is to be a parent. I know what it's like to just look away for a second and then, yeah. oh, God, where, where's, totally. where's Joey or whatever. Um, I, I get that as a parent. So I'm not trying to add it on there. And I'm certainly not trying to scare parents. But it really is our job. Our, our kids are not going to be mentally and physically equipped to really protect themselves well into their late teens, you know, I, yeah. for the most part. Yeah. Um, so it's, but it's a, it's that really doesn't mean that we don't introduce these concepts early on. And unfortunately, with with women, you know, with females, my daughters, they're unfortunately probably going to experience violence at a much younger age than my son is. It, it's where boys actually, for the most part, they'll navigate in a normal situation. I'm not, I'm not talking like a gang situation or anything like that. Okay. But in normal, a normal education situation, they're going to they're going to encounter violence. Um, the way men, we use violence to communicate sometimes, you know, it's, it's like, it's a pecking yeah. order yep. and locker room violence. Girls don't. You when don't, they push, you don't push, you, yeah. If you're pushing, you're fighting hardcore guys who punch each other. Yeah. It's done or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Girls, girls, when they experience violence, it's the real thing. And so I find female clients get it on, get, get, um, are much easier to train for the most part because they don't have any of that baggage that guys bring into it. Tough um, stuff. Yeah, it, it, they get over. You have to get over that. You know, a lot of times when I'll train a, a bunch of alphas, of like a, like a maybe like a tier one um, spec ops group, I basically have to let those guys beat the crap out of each other for a while wow. before they even listen to me. You know, I'll just if I tell them, hey, here's the here's the best way. This is how you're going to learn the best. It's like they're, they're not going to listen. So so I'm just going to let them hit each other for a while, <laughs> and then they're going to look at me with their cracked up bodies, and I'm okay. You're ready to learn now. You yeah, know, that's, and, that's you know, beautiful. I love that stuff. Yeah, that'll, that'll women, 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 women get it right off the bat. They'll they'll use pure technique. They'll uh, they'll, they'll do what you ask. But I think it's really important if you have daughters. I you know I think everybody has to understand that um, it's important that you bring these concepts up. I, I will train women at, uh, at the age of eleven, mm -hmm. um, which you know, most boys with the, with what I train. Like my oldest son, he didn't really learn. He didn't come to a seminar until he was 17 and a half. I just mm -hmm. didn't want him navigating high school with this information. You know, boys sometimes have maturity levels. It. Yeah, and they don't understand. They don't really understand the seriousness of injury to the human body. Um, you can just rage and they, they start fighting with his buddies. Like, watch this move. Oh yeah, that's it's exactly. Just, well, yeah, yeah. Just it's, like, like, it's almost like a gun, right? Well, yeah, it kills me when I look like on YouTube and you'll see kids coming up behind each other and punching each other in the kidneys and stuff Crazy. like that, just as, as a joke, you know? And, um, you know, you just have to, you have to navigate that. But, yeah, it's, it's extremely important. I, I think martial arts and combat sports are fantastic, especially with the right instructor who can instill yeah. discipline, work ethic. All of those things are fantastic. And body awareness and, and yeah, anti-bullying, all that kind of stuff is, is, is really, really good. From a true self-protection and protecting your kids from these predators that are out there, unfortunately, that's still going to lay heavily on us. Wow. So you're from Vegas. Um, I, I'm based out of Vegas. I'm, I, I was a Navy brat, so I moved all, all over. over. Yeah, my dad was an officer, and we, we lived all over the country and overseas and everything. So so, so, so now that you're in Vegas, so uh, you, I'm in Canada. I'm a big yeah. hockey fan. Oh, yeah. So how's the Vegas Knights? Oh, man. Dude, I've never seen Are you in? Town. Are you a I've fan? I've never seen this town take off the way it has, man. Incredible story. Amazing. Amazing thing. story. Incredible. Just to go to the games is incredible. So you've gone. You know? You've gone to the games. Have you, oh, were, you, yeah. were you a hockey fan before the Vegas Knights? Yeah, well, so I grew up – I was born originally in Boston, so I was, yeah, a, I was okay. a Boston fan gotcha. for a long time. My whole family was. Didn't really have an opportunity as I moved around the country. You know, we, didn't, we weren't always in hockey towns. So it was nice to come back. And so I, I went to the games this year. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't Amazing. believe the, just the, the way the town took to it and supported it. And Vegas does a great job in the presentation, and they make it really fun. Uh, so, like, yeah. it's, it's, it, like you talk about a, a team coming into the league, and now they're running. They may actually win the cup. It would be a one-time in history. 
But you, there's a lot of talk about that shooting in in Vegas yeah. and how the team came around. And it's amazing, uh, a horrible situation. But the and the it was they say that was part of them bonding uh, bonding together. Did you see any of that happening? Yeah. Well, okay. So I have a I have a very personal story about that. My the night of the shooting, my wife and I were packing. I was going to go do a, uh, a I, I do it every year with Tony Robbins. I, I I go to one of his big platinum events and I run I run them through self protection training. Very cool. Um, so and we always do it in a really cool part of the world. And then we we're doing this in Maui. We we're getting ready. So Sasha and I are packing that night. She gets a call. I hear her phone go. She's in the back you know back uh, area in the, in the closet packing. And my wife really doesn't swear. And, you know, all of a sudden I heard this, you know, basically WTF. And yeah. she, she leans out to me. She says, turn my radio on. So her police radio was right behind me. Turn it on. We heard the whole thing unfolding when it came She's down. On the police radio. Holy shit. Oh, yeah. Right. The police. And, and wow, what people man. don't understand is they Holy thought shit. in the beginning. So you've got this place being shot up. you got everybody running out. Now, where the confusion was, and this is why they thought it was like a Mumbai style thing where multiple hotels were. Yeah. What happened was you had all these people running out and they were told, get out of here, go, go, go. They're and running you're back to their about hotel. The festival. The festival. Yeah, they're, they're, they're covered, some of them are covered in blood because I, I'm telling you, Ben, these people are running out. People are dropping on either side of them. You know, when they're getting shot, it, it was horrific. My wife ends up being the incident commander and she goes and takes, takes over that whole scene. Jeez has to deal with all of that carnage and everything and her guys. Um, one of my friend's daughters was shot. Sasha lost one of her officers was killed. Um, and then we had two other friends that were shot. We were supposed to be at that concert. The reason okay. we decided not to, because we had to fly out the next morning for Hawaii. Holy shit. And we gave our tickets away and it was just surreal all around. But the community, uh, you know, as you, as you said, the, the response of the community was absolutely mm. Because Vegas has this, this idea, oh, it's a transient Transient, yeah, really totally. I got to tell you, it's been amazing to see the community. And the Knights were a big part of that. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it, I'm, I'm glad we chatted about that. I never even thought of that having, like, your your wife was, like, running that area. Like, that's that's unbelievable. Yeah, I'm really sorry about that. I Like, you just you just think about that, it's just, just a kick in the gut, you know? Yeah. So, but, yeah, no, that, but, the, but, yeah, it's pretty amazing, though. It's a bunch of misfits. I love that psychology behind all these misfits, they're like, you know what? Screw you all. I know we're not all superstars. We're going to win this whole thing. Like it's, I love the underdog. You know, it's, it's, um, uh, everyone I talk to, even from Vegas, they're just wildly, uh, hockey fans now. It's, it's, it's so cool are, to see. The guys are so humble too. They're such good mm. dudes. I work out at a, at a strength for Saint, uh, training facility where a lot of them work on the off season. So I got to know some of the guys before the team even started. Oh, and they're cool. coming in and they're cool. just cool guys, you know, and yeah. just they, they do the work and uh, man, I'm really happy to see that they, they've had such an amazing season. Yeah. Yeah. They're, uh, they, they have a chance. They definitely yeah. have a chance. So let me just take a look here. I've got a couple more things. We can probably start wrapping it up. But um, now if, if, if you were to say, uh, like I was thinking about, you have a story about how you were, uh, you're pursuing being a, a Navy SEAL and you were dominant in that area. Like you were, it was a yeah. guarantee you were going to be a leader uh, you, you end up going into a underwater test and, and a, a current blew your eardrum out. And, and, and that's what, so I, I know that story's there, but I kind of want to have an angle where like you were on a mission to be a Navy SEAL, right? Like yeah. it was, I could imagine you just being lights out focused, right? Like nothing in the world matters. And then all of a sudden it all changes. Yeah. Like I just think about what was going through. Cause I know even when I, my plans change, I'm a bit upset. This is like your entire life change. What was that like transferring to going, what the frick do I do now? Yeah, Matt, that's exactly, I thought my life was over. Um, so just to quickly, I won't rehash yeah, the whole thing, totally. but to tell people, so I was going into a situation, I was, I, back then you have to imagine, now special operations and stuff like SEAL teams are wildly popular. Everybody, you know, wants to, you know, B1 and, and yeah. then all. A lot of guys are building training there. programs around it now. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, well nobody was, uh, uh, no, nobody was, uh, around back then that, um, that, that really knew about the SEAL teams. You know, it was something I was a Navy brat and I, I found out about it just because I lived literally across the street from the training area. I couldn't believe these, what these guys were up to, what they were doing. And I was laughing. I was like, 
I was like, man, I, I can't believe this. There's a, there's a, um, there's a job out there where you can shoot weapons, get paid. <laughs> you know, you're thinking like a typical kid. Oh, yeah. like even and, even and as a like, guy, any guy is going to think it's cool. Most any, yeah. any guy's guy, you know. Yeah, it's it's so you know as a, as a young kid, you know, I'm I'm totally enamored with this. And my dad just says, "Listen, that's fine. You say you want to do this, that's great. Just make sure you get an education. You know, you can do it after college." So I made him that deal, and I stuck to it. Um, but I, I went into it knowing, okay, this is going to be this is going to be tough because I know there's only so many slots because they didn't want people being seals, especially if you're an officer. Really, it was a waste of money. Yeah, back then it was a nuclear navy. They wanted oh, I so I had twenty five hundred guys that um, applied for the deal for two slots. I did the one thing I did, and this is this will apply to your people. Was I told myself I am not going to leave anything on the table. You know, I worked yeah. too damn hard. I realized it's going to be tough, but what can I do? You know, what can I do? So I knew that the guy that made the decision was in Washington. He uh, he's called a detailer. And he has final say. He has final say on everything. Um, and I said, you know what? Come hell or high water, I'm going to at least get in front of this guy. I'm not going to leave yeah. it up to chance. I'm going to, you know, I, I, I'm going to go. Make it happen. Him. And I'm going to make it happen, you know, and just see, you know, let this guy know that I'm serious. So I go, I fly out to Washington. I had a buddy that was going to school up there. I, I get there. I'd already made some inroads with his secretary, so I was sending her flowers and stuff like that. So I, mean, <laughs> I, I heard from some of my other buddies. That's why I, I think you know. That's do you know Steve Sims? It's it's his style. Oh right? yeah, <laughs> Steve Sims. Yeah. So we were we were laughing about this story, and and so uh, I, I go there. I t I took care of her. She said, "Well, she goes. Listen, I don't think I can let you see him, but you know, you can sit here." And so I sat there. So. This was on a like a Wednesday, and so I stayed there all Wednesday, all Thursday, all Friday, all day. All like you're Friday. talking like nine in the morning to what? Sitting five at night, like, sitting on the couch. The guy just ignores me when he walks by. Doesn't even know I'm. The, you know, doesn't even. And you're. Much. And was it like a stubborn like I don't give a shit. I'm sitting here till you talk to me. I just, yeah, I just you know. So just for context, this guy was the decider. Yeah. Okay. He was it, and I tracked him down, and and I knew this. And so 4.30, 4.30 on Friday, he pops his head. I goes, Midshipman, you still here? And I said, yes, sir. He says, why are you in my office? He goes, I need you out of my office. I said, sir, I just need five minutes of your time. And he says, you know, and he makes a big production and has me come in. <laughs> I love it. So I'm sitting, I'm shaking in my boots because I'm thinking, oh, man, I really screwed up. And so I basically told him, I said, listen, sir, I said, I know you got a lot of, you know, you got a lot of qualified applicants in front of you. We all look the same on paper. I just want you to know one thing. If you pick me, I won't quit. Nice. <laughs> so Love and I, know, and I know that's what you're worried about. I know you're worried that you're going to get it. You guys, I just want you to know I won't quit. And he goes, that's why you came here? That's why you had to see me? I said, yes, sir. He goes, okay, you've said it. I'll see you later. I'm like, oh, shit. I go, okay, yeah. so I leave. I say bye to Margaret, his secretary, and I walk out. So I'm walking down like this long corridor on the Navy building. Mm -hmm. I'm just walking, and I'm thinking, oh, man, I really screwed up. This kid who was a JG, who was in there, he's a lieutenant JG, he's running, he runs up behind me and he goes, hey, Mitch Shipman. I'm telling this man, I can't let you leave. He goes, I just want you to know. He goes, you had it after the first day. We just wanted to see how many days you'd stay there. <laughs> Love basically. that. But yeah, so they just tested me for that. And, and sure, I got one or two slots. So. Beautiful. Yeah. So I do the whole thing. Yeah, I, I fly through. I know everything because I lived across from the base and I knew a lot of teams. So I knew everything about training. So I had this unfair advantage. I rubbed it in everybody's face. And were you, yeah, were you man, cocky? Totally. I was yeah. totally cocky. You had to be. You're in a shark tank there. And uh, you never show you never show weakness. And it's a bunch yeah. of alphas. And of course, we're competing, even though we're working as teams, we're competing because the better you do, the better selection you get for where you yeah. want to go. So yeah. I literally had finished up everything hard and I was I was ready to go do this. I had this one dive, as you said, which was a, basically a what they call an admin dive. It was a no big deal. It wasn't like one of the big tests or anything. And I pushed it. I could have, I was congested that day, but I didn't want to redo the dive on Saturday because of, you know, eat up my weekend. That's exactly and, you know, what I would do. I had day, done, beer drink, done. you know, <laughs> just, um, and if it's not a big deal, just bang it out. Right. Oh uh, yeah. So yeah, much lessons like, you know, in that, man. Nothing, nothing. It's phased me to that point, you know? Um, 
but sure enough, it was just enough to where, you know, you have waves on top of water. You also have waves that come through the water, you know, underwater. And this wall of water just kind of like, we were going up and down. I was tying explosives onto this uh, Jap scully, which is an obstacle. And sure enough, man, this, this wall of water just kind of hit my ear. Now, if it happened to you, it'd be no big deal. It wouldn't bother. But my ears were so congested. First, the ear jump sent me into... Uh, sent me into vertigo, lost all, all control of my body. First time in my life I ever had true injury to the human body hmm. where no matter what I wanted to do, I, I, all I could do is react. And, um, and that changed my life in a second. I could tell, I, I was able to get up. I was, they got me on board. When they got me on board the, the little boat, blood was coming out of both sides of my ears. I could tell that we had a super competent medical corpsman there. And I could tell just, he looked in my ear real quick. I could tell just by the look in his face that I was done. Like done, so, yeah, done on a big picture, instant. done. Huh? What was like, that? Like, like done your mission, everything. Oh, like yeah. Not done that like, day, done the like big You're picture. never going to dive. You're never going to be able to pressurize dive again. It looked, and that was the whole key. Now, the funny thing is now, of course, what happened to me, they could have fixed it now with the technology we have. Mm. Back then, no chance. Yeah. So, so yeah, so, so Ben, you're sitting there going, Oh my God, my whole, you know, for me, I'm like 21. I'm thinking my life. Yeah, man, you're, and you're peaking, right? You're just, you're well, just seven, peaking. seven years of prepping for this, uh, you know, seven yeah. years. And I had done everything. I mean, I was, I was the guy, I was already going to seal team four, which was the hottest team back then. Um, Cause they were doing all the kind of narcotics work. You were work. Uh, if you watch like Narcos or any of those shows, that's, that's what seal team four was doing. They're, cool. they're working down there. So uh, I had it all planned out. And sure enough, you know. Uh, so what? What is? So what did you do? Like what? Go, like I almost can guarantee you, you probably feel it today, that the process. But like, like did you like did you go through depression? Did you start drinking? Mm -hmm. Like, like what was the process of going? You just got shot. You vir virtually could have died, right? Like I could imagine, like the yeah. amount of energy that would be go to Navy SEALs. Like, what, what was what was your reaction? What was it, what was it looking like? Well, so you know, and I tell people this all the time. It ended up. I mean, the, the, the idea that injury stopped me from doing what I wanted mm -hmm. to do and then injury to the human body basically became my mission statement, you know, for, for the future. At the time, I didn't know that. Um, but it, it, it really, it, it really, I really look back on it as, wow, that's, this is where, this is where what my happened? life changed. And it, it took away all the things that I thought were important. Like I thought I had mm -hmm. to be the badass operator I had to be this guy, you know, my whole thought process was, well, how can I do anything now? Because I'm never going to be able to have the you know, the credentials or whatever. Sure. I thought yeah. Yeah. Well, your whole, I bet you your whole identity is wrapped in that, right? Yeah. yeah especially at 21, you know, that's oh, the yeah. Whole thing. oh yeah. And, um, so yeah, so I, I stayed in, they, they liked me, meaning I'd done very well in the training community. I lucked out that the, the, the seals were expanding during this time. And so we went from being this small group that was part of the Navy to this small group that now is part of this huge special operations command where the army is involved, the air force is involved, everybody, everybody's working together. So there's all this opportunity expansion going on and they didn't have the bodies. So they said, Hey, listen, we're going to send you back. You they can't be a bad. seal. They, 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 you can't be a seal, but we're going to send you to intelligence school and you're going to come back and be a special warfare intelligence guy. And you're going to work for the Admiral, which is like the, the most powerful command. Wow. And I got involved in this, this command. I, I was a junior guy that had no business being there. And it opened doors for me that I still to this day have access to. Wow. Um, so you, so you me, never could, have, you never could have told me that though, back then, you know, that this was going to be such a, it ended up being probably the best thing that ever happened to me was that. Do you believe in meant to be then? Well, here's like, that's here's pretty, the, I don't you, share this. I don't, I don't share this story too often, but, Here's another really strange thing, you know, asking what you, you never understand why things happen. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying this would happen to me, but the guy that took my slot was a guy named John Connor. And I had been doing um, Grenada or not Grenada. I'm sorry. Uh, mm. um, we did uh, Panama, you know, when I was in, I got out right after the Panama invasion. Okay. First guy killed in Panama was John. He was killed on that, that tarmac. Uh, people probably don't remember now, but at that point, we lost seven guys in one day. We, we, we lost the most we had ever lost wow. since Vietnam. And Johnny was the, the first guy, um, wow. the first guy 
So, so when you heard that, it's like, holy crap. I reported it to the Admiral. I got the, I got the feed from the guys at group and I was the one that reported it was surreal to even talk about it. And, um, it, you know, uh, I'm and again, it, you know, a million other things could have happened, but it was just yeah. interesting that, that John was the guy that, that went down. He was, he was, he took the, the time at Silting four and it was his platoon that, that, uh, got, you know, just cross fired and killed all those guys from the tournament. Unbelievable. So now, now you're now like, it's funny. Everyone identifies you as the, uh, the expert in your field, but you're a businessman. Yeah. Like you have to be, you know what I mean? It's funny. We, we brush over some of this where everyone goes with the, you know, like your skill set or what you do, but, but, but you, you had to become a businessman to build your company. Right. So yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I think, I think that's where most people fall on their face. They don't understand that if you really believe that I believe in what I do. And when I walked in and when I saw this type of training at its inception, you know, we've evolved a lot since that day, but my passion was, Oh, this is what I've been looking for all my life. And I'm so excited. Like any chance I get to somebody that's in our self-protection to show them what we have, I think it really is the most direct pro approach to dealing with violence. But the issue is nobody cares that you have the best approach. You have to tell mm -hmm. people that you have the best approach. You have to get that message out there. You have to control people. You have to find out what triggers. You have to make sure it's focused on them, not you. Totally. I mean, you know, the totally. whole thing. And, and, and you have to learn those skill sets. You have to learn how to market yourself, yeah. tell your story. And the reason you do it, you know, people, it's so funny because people, they're so adverse to learning how to sell and learning how totally. to market. My thing is it, it's, you got a duty to do that because if not, that guy's going to give, say it's a hundred bucks that he wants to give to somebody. He's going to give it to whoever gives the most convincing and, uh, you know, pitch that you are going to solve his problem. And, you know, if, if I let a lesser group grab that information and this guy thinks he's going to have really good self-protection. It's an injustice I've, almost. I've failed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I just think it's, I, people are getting better at it. I got to say it's, it's better now um, that people are learning better, you know, marketing and business. But you know what, if, if you're not passionate about it, like you're, you're, you, you drip passion about it. Like it's, yeah. it's so easy to sell when you love what you do. How many companies oh, yeah. right now are trying to sell and it's selling shit. Like if exactly. that's, that's probably the issue more yeah. than anything. Cause if you love what you do, like, like oh, no yeah. problem. Like if you believe it, I'm like, tell me I'm wrong that you can't. Yeah. This is yeah. like, a, if you truly believe in it, like it, that's, I think that's, what's missing a lot too. Like you're saying, maybe like, I think a lot of systems are out there that manipulate to make money and yeah. the missing factor is they're not really into the business. You know what no. I mean? No. And they're not, I was talking to somebody the other day that, that uh, you know, the way he said it, and he's, he's a really well-known guy um, in the, in the marketing world, but he's always sold. I hate to say this, but, but real stuff, you know, he's sold, stuff, yeah. he's, sold, he's sold, he's sold real, real things that he's passionate about, but not with the idea of putting something together just to do a launch. Yeah. Make money and, and yeah. you know, I, ethically I can't do it because the products that I'm selling, you know, people are, you know, they have to use my products. It's going to be a really serious situation. And therefore I got to you know be able to sleep at night. I got to make sure totally. that what I'm putting out is, is, you know, truly congruent with what I feel, you know? And, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm passionate that way, but I, I see people, I think the worst thing you can do is probably take something that you really love and turn it into a business. Um, you know, like it takes that's a, a lot that's of a highly thing. controversial thing you just said, cause you know what everyone else is saying. Oh, find your passion and turn it. And it's, yeah. it's like every, you go Google how to make money at your passion. It's the hottest ticket right now. And I'm, oh, yeah. So explain yourself. What do you mean by that? So don't turn your passion into money. Is that what you're saying? What I'm saying is don't think just because you're passionate about something, if you're not with, if you truly are passionate about it, then you're going to do the work and you, and the work includes, you know, like I got a lot of guys that are great instructors, but they don't want to do anything else. They don't want to, they just want to show up. I got thing. a room full of people. They don't care how I got that room full of people there. They don't want to, they just want to train the people. And that's like the tip of the iceberg. That's the fun stuff. You know, if you're really passionate, are you passionate enough to sit there and say, I'm going to learn everything I can about business. I'm going to learn about how to set up, you know, systems and functions. So this is, this is that. the stuff that that's, that's not passion. fun that you, yeah. you, know, you gotta, you gotta almost have one leg and still want to race, you yeah, know, exactly. exactly. It, what's driving you can't be the money. Like it just can't. Because no. you're going to go up and down hardcore. What's going to, what's going to, most people plan a short game, right? 
yeah. there's, there's a, that's that's because it's quick buck. But if it's something that you're willing to almost die for, like if you can find that, you're done, right? Yeah, yeah, and that's just it. And, and for me, it's easy. Like I never, people laugh at me all the time. They go, oh, "Are you bored of this?" I go, "No, actually, my greatest." I never get bored with the basic course where I have a group, like I'm going to Houston Amazing. this weekend. I got 60 people that I'm going to show up and it's 60 people that I know I'm going to see them on Saturday morning and I can't wait to see them Sunday night because they're going to, yeah, I'm going to be able to inculcate them during that whole time. And I love that transformation probably. That's my favorite, my, my amazing. favorite course is that. And, and that's 20, how many years? How many years that's have you done like that course? 20, this is like 27 feet. So right that's, now. that's amazing. That's like, you got, you got some, you have authority to speak about something. You know what I mean? 25 years and you still love what you do. People are you know, dying that, for that's that. That's a very just, good point. You know, Ben, one thing I will tell you is I had a 10 year apprenticeship that I worked under the guy that was my original instructor. Mm. And I had no problem. I could care less about how much money I was making. Love it. I, this guy was, you know, he was a really difficult personality. Um, and he wasn't formally educated, but he's absolutely brilliant. And he saw arcs and angles that nobody's ever, I've never mm. met anybody that knows it. I love mentoring under him. I love learning everything I could. And for years, I was not, the, I was never the face of anything. I just was, I was a very good instructor but I was learning everything I could. I was learning how to like, not only, not only was I learning how to instruct properly and how to hold a crowd and do all those things, but then I was also learning, you know, the back of the, you know, the back of the business. I was learning yeah. okay, where to take totally. it in. I, I saw the whole thing from soup to nuts on what but was going on. People miss that, right? Like, yeah. like if I was to learn something, I'll work for free. I did. When I yeah. started as a real, I, I always could do sales marketing. I was coaching real estate agents. I thought I'm going to be a realtor myself. And I, and I met the I met a guy that was one of the top guys that I trusted. I said, I'm going to work for you for free. He goes, what are you talking about? I said, you got 30 days of my time. I got to learn everything. Like it, it, the value in that, I would have paid for that. Yeah. I, think, I think that level is not there anymore. I became rookie of the year, dominate the whole thing. The thing is, of course you did. You know what I mean? Like, of course. that That's what happens when you, when you, a lot of people aren't willing to put in the work. I think you nailed it. They're just yeah. not willing to, and it's the, it's the, it's the boring grind. Like, stuff that stuff that like I want to you just want to go train you just want to well, and the fun part is helping people but there's so much that goes on behind the scenes that people miss well the other thing people don't understand is you can do it from whatever your situation is but the first entrepreneurial um, stuff I really learned was when I was a junior officer in the Navy I got my guys every course they wanted I could requisition the amazing equipment for everybody I got us trainings like I, everything from like Evelyn speed reading to all this other stuff. And people are always like, how are you able to do this? How are you able to yeah. you know, get all this stuff? Well, in the special operations community, nobody wants to do paperwork. Nobody <laughs> wants to do it. And everybody just wants to bitch. Well, I found out, hey, you know what? The supply chiefs are down over here. These are the guys that basically, they control everything. Back then, it was mostly Filipinos that were running. We called it the Filipino Mafia. Nice. And I went down, and I met a senior chief down there. I took him to lunch. I, I bought him. I found out what kind of bourbon he drank. Man, I, all that other stuff. <laughs> I love it. And all I asked him, all I asked him, I said, I said, hey, chief, I said, I just want to make sure every time I give you paperwork, it's done exactly the way you need it done. So all you have to do is say yes or no. Make it easy. And yeah. Nobody had ever done that. Everybody, all they ever do is they come down and yell and scream. No and, way. And, and, this guy taught me how to do paperwork correctly. He taught me how to get extra stuff. He taught me how to do like all the ins and outs because I actually wanted to learn. And so it took me probably about, I don't know, two to three months of submitting things to where I got the system down. But that's a long and game, I, right? You would have taken And I was six golden. Months. Yeah. I, in, in the military, I was golden. I was wearing the best, like, they were so mad. I got these uh, GSG9 boots. They used to be like the big counterterrorism <laughs> boots made by Adidas. Nice. All my guys had it. The only other guys that had it were the guys at SEAL Team Six, and because uh, you because yeah. you did the paperwork right, really. Well, the, it, it's not even that. It's, it's the took the I, time. You know, I absolutely. stopped. I stopped complaining about the system. So I stopped, great. and I just said, you know what? Yeah, I found a guy who I knew could teach me how to do it correctly, and I made it worth his while. And I backed it up. The other thing that he saw was, hey, this young guy's actually listening, and he's making my job a hell of a lot easier. He's given me great paperwork. So yeah. he was totally motivated to help me out. Yeah, that's, that's uh, like, I, we literally could do a whole talk on this. This is my, I, my, that's my favorite topic. It's blow the mind of your client and let your, let your conversation behind your back be your brand. 
So you got to do something so freaking cool, so out there, do something that is, and usually it's it's through a relationship. It's that like you really listen to them. You you you, you got them a gift that no, they didn't even know that you were paying attention, but you had them get him the cigar from Cuba when you were there that he wanted. And exactly. Just a simple thoughtfulness. I think business should be thoughtfulness training versus anything else, to be honest. Because I think then everyone's going to go online. Your social media strategy is pretty much everyone bragging about you, not because of it's a strategy, because it's just amazing to do business that way. It sounds it sounds like a lot, a, very similar to what uh, you're doing. So I get excited about it. Yeah, you have to, man. I mean, that, that, that's just it. But you also have to have curiosity. You have to sit there and, um, it, you know, it's really easy to sit there and say, oh, it's too hard to learn sales. It's too hard to do this. I want to outsource this or, or do whatever. Totally. You, you can't. You have, nobody's going to know your product better. And yeah. you have to, I tell everybody, you can, you can outsource after you've done it. But you have to do it first. You yeah, have to absolutely. You can't. You can't even outsource properly unless you know. No. You're not going to hire the right guy. You're going to bring in someone that's a better salesman than you, and they're going to convince you they know the answer because you don't know your own game. And then they're they're just you're just going to pay them and be like, oh, that sucked. And then you could be a victim and say it was their fault. Like yeah. there's that cycle, right? I'm sure yeah. you see it. Oh yeah, I've paid guys that I've paid some outrageous fees, um, and I've let them, you know, do Run their it. thing. Me too, man. And it just, it was, it was just, you know, ridiculous. You just think, you, know? you just think they're like, and, and that's a, it, I think it comes down to this area. I don't believe in myself as much as I would these guys. And it does come down to that psychology. So whenever I put someone on a pedestal going, I need that guy to, I always check in, you know, like I always check in and be like, is this, is this a pedestal thing? Or is this really me looking for an expert? Like, you know, or is it so, but I got a question from Steve Sims. He has asked me to uh, give you a question. And, no and it's so, so I said, uh, so um, where is it here? So he says this. <laughs> he says, you're one of the one guy he would never mess with, first of all. <laughs> He's the one guy. And he also, he said this. He got two questions, I think. What's the scariest, one of the scariest people you know is the first question. Okay. That would be, it's a guy nobody knows. Um, <clears throat> it was when I was doing research for the book. He is a uh, shop caller. Um, He's a shot caller and a hitter, which means an assassin for the Mexican mafia. Come on. And, and he, he is probably one of the most chilling guys I've ever met in my life. Just no hesitation. Killed, you know, at least 20, 20 something people inside that he, that he's there. Uh, they talk about him in just such terms. Like, you know, he's, he's almost not even human. The, the way and not because he doesn't wow. feel he feels pain he just has no hesitation he understands exactly what it is he doesn't come across when you see him he doesn't come across as like you wouldn't point to him and say okay he's it's obvious he's this guy he's an intense guy but you met, you met him in jail when inter interviewing i did well i got a really funny story about that so <laughs> i got great i got great contacts in, in corrections and one of my corrections guys he literally got me into the to like the Uber section of corrections where these guys are interviewing the worst of the worst. I mean, these wow. guys are, just, I mean, the true shot callers for the Aryan Brotherhood, for the Black Rilla family, for the Mexican Mafia. And these guys have done the debriefs. And so me being me, I'm like, hey, great, they got me in. I said, well, listen, I said, I don't, you know, and I really meant it this way. I go, hey, I don't want to, you guys already helped me out here. Just why don't you set up an interview for me? And I'll just, I'll just interview. And the guy just started laughing, looking at me, just, yeah, no, you don't want to do that. And I go, wow. oh, no, no, I'm, I'm fine. I just, he goes, oh, okay, let me just tell you. I've been doing this for whatever, like almost 30 years. He said, I've changed my records four times. And I've just come to live that, that these guys know where I live. They know my family. They know my, my everything. He goes, no, he goes, they've never threatened me. But I know they know that. They've run it on me. He said, he said you don't need this in your life. He said, he said, give me whatever you want to know. And I'll ask these guys. But they'd let me watch like video and stuff like that. They don't even want them to know who you are. I, I, I got to tell you, I'm so thankful no that, that he did that and he educated me. And, and I was just naive. I didn't really, totally. really understand what I was asking for. And um, he said, he goes, just for understanding, he goes, curiosity goes both ways. Mm. He said, not only are they going to be curious about you, he goes, but they have the assets. He goes, they run the streets from prison. From, from prison. Wow. Yeah. And he said, he said, you'll be very easy to find and very easy to follow. Well, for sure. Yeah. And so I didn't, 
I didn't, you know, that was, that was a game changer for me on, on mindset and everything. But this individual, like, I've seen guys that are like, you know, I love it when people say, oh, this guy's so tough, or that guy's so this, or that. I'm like, nah, you haven't. You don't even know. You know, And you don't want to be that way. I mean, there's nothing, yeah. I've never been impressed with that kind of stuff because yeah. violence is such a, a random thing, meaning um, the idea that of, of – I think I have a lot of respect for a great combat athlete. Don't get me wrong. That, that's awesome. Yeah. But the problem with violence is it can take the best athlete in the world. And if a guy hits him over the head with a hammer, it, it, it's over, you know? Yeah. And so I'm not, I'm, I've never been that impressed with that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I don't mean that for the guy, but just, I realize how, how just unforgiving violence is it, and, yeah. and that anybody's susceptible to it. And, you know, once you're okay with that, once you understand, like I understand that, I walk out this door, I catch a pipe to the back of the head. I, I got 27 years of an instructor, another 10 years of training. Doesn't matter. Like, doesn't matter. Doesn't, doesn't matter, matter at all. Unless I'm the one doing it, it, it won't help me. Yeah. Um, but I'm okay with that. And, and the great part about that is people have to understand, okay, that's, that's a little bit intimidating to realize that, but realize it works both ways. They're the same thing. I mean, the one greatest thing I learned from these guys, uh, from, from like, and like I say in the book, the best information often comes from the worst people. And I find that in business too, meaning interesting. I've learned the most useful stuff from some of the most difficult personalities. And usually they're difficult because they don't brook um, idiots. You know, they won't put up with any, any, any morons. Um, they're usually cantankerous, but they will usually have really good info for you if you're willing to hear it. Mm-hmm. And um, it just might you know, not come in the way you want it. No, it's never going to come the way yeah. you want it. And, and that's yeah. what gets people, again, people think they should get it a certain way. I'm like, no, no, you're going to get it the way this guy's going to give it to you. And either yeah. you have the ability to, you know, take it and then use it in your own life, or you can sit there and complain. But just that we're not comfortable with who we are. And, it, you know, people get so triggered all the time and just information, yeah. right? People take things a lot personally. So last, yeah. so what the other part of the question was, what scares you? So I don't uh, know why Steve wants to know this, so I'd be suspicious. Yeah. But. No, it's the same <laughs> thing. I got to tell you, it's the same thing that uh, I, I met my wife, and my son. Uh, my, she met my, my son was about eleven when she met me, and then we got him. I got him right to just about college, and I was thinking, oh, I've done my job. You know, it's good. It's, 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 it's a good thing. And then I'll tell you what. I had my. I, we had our kids. You know, we we had the the, the other three, and having daughters. Mm. has completely i understand the vulnerabilities i mean stuff i used to be able to do as a contractor i did a lot of contract work you know yeah i, I mean you're so yeah. vulnerable with your kids you know you, and, what you're saying is you need to take care of them is that yeah. what you're referring to so you're yeah scared yeah it, to, and to, that's it, it, it means, like what happens it, if you're not there is that what you're yeah, saying so, yeah so, I, so, I can totally relate to that Sending me to parts of the world that I used to go to. I used to spend, I spent a lot of time in Venezuela before Chavez days. I, I, I've done a lot of work in South America, totally comfortable with myself. Like and whatever. Whatever. Yeah. And, and because I, I'm never stupid about it. I'm always calculated to say, yeah. okay, I, there is risk, but I'm going to mitigate it this way. And I'm okay. I'm okay with the risk reward here. I can't think that way with kids anymore, you know, with, with my little ones and stuff. And I, and I have to recognize yeah, also totally. that I, need you. I gotta, I gotta give up control too, because they're mm. going to become little people and I'm going to have to just, you know, navigate those waters. And, and that to me, and I've never four, felt fear right? before like that, you know, fear, fear that you would just leave them. Like what would happen, yeah, right? And that if I'm That's not really around for them and, yeah. and uh, yeah, it, it, it's really weird. It, like, I've had so many ups and downs with business and personal life and stuff like that. That sure. doesn't scare me. That's, that's life. But it's also just happening to me, you know, yeah, and so it's true. when you have so other true, people man. that you're responsible for that you're there, it's, it's like, I know a lot of guys that are absolutely amazing individuals, brave and everything, but we all get humbled by the fact that, yeah, I can't always be that guy because I got to think about these little ones that I've got, you know, and, and, totally. uh, the, yeah. it, life, life changes, right? Like my whole, every decision I make comes back down to how's it going to affect those kids. And I got five exactly. of them, my wife, yeah. like at the end of the yeah. day, do you feel that if like those relationships are foundational, right? Like those, if those shake, everything shakes, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. That, it, it's funny. It really does. It, 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 you know, I've, I've read, Sto- it's hard to even say this because it's become such a buzzword now, but, but for years I read Stoic philosophy, you know, and I read Epictetus and, and, and everything. And, and I was a kid, I was affected by it because 
1972, when uh, the uh, prisoners of war came back, I think it was 72 or 74, they came back to uh, Virginia Beach, where I was at. And so Stockdale came. And Stockdale was one of the big proponents of, of Stoic philosophy. And and, uh, and he came out. And I, as a little kid, I was introduced to the Stoic philosophy. And there's one thing that I, I read, and I, I forget what, I think it was in Discourses with, uh, with Epictetus, but he talks about, he talks about the idea of not being in love with anything that can be taken away from you. And the idea is to appreciate it, to sit there and say, thing, and it's going to sound very harsh, but I understand <laughs> it. And I, and I have not achieved this at all. But instead of saying, I love this woman who's next to me, to protect yourself, because it could be taken away from you, you say, I love having this as the smell of a woman who's there. I love the fact that a woman has hair, but you don't, you don't, put it all in one basket you don't put it in mm. for this kid or that and it's extremely hard to like do. is it realistic though like it's i think well, I'm in, I, it. like i'm all in with mine yeah. and it's like i think if bad things happen i'm gonna deal with it and like i think that's yeah. my plan you know my plan's yeah. like hey it's gonna suck but i think i can go through it i've got i lived on the streets i had a crazy life i think i can handle it it would crush me but man to, how do you disconnect during like how? Well, that's just that's just it. I, and I always felt it was a really interesting. Um, it's true though. Like if you're not idea. connected, yeah, it's not that you don't connect. It's that you you recognize the connection, but you recognize the connection um, is is what you appreciate about the person. Yeah, that's good. But realizing the person could be taken away from you at any time. Yeah, and, it's almost like you need, you want them, but you don't need them. Like it's almost it, like that. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I've gone through that process. So I'm going to finish up with um, every time I bring someone on a guest, I always think I always think I got a chance to have you ask me a question, and and to challenge me. Like if there's nothing there, that's cool. But if you were to ask me a question, what would you ask? What motivated you? Because there's there's a ton of people out there. You obviously you're doing fine in your business and stuff, but you got a strong. It's obvious you got a strong urge to share a message. Mm -hmm. What what was the drive to do that? You know, I, I'm always curious with guys when, when they have their own shows and their own podcasts and you, you ask great questions, but what's the old, what's the ultimate, what's the ultimate goal for you? What does this help you do? You know, does it yeah, help you think better? Does, that, does it help you? Does it help you better in, in just your life? And so, Cause I don't get the idea. Yeah. I don't get the, I get the idea that you enjoy interviewing you know, people and stuff, but I get the yeah. idea that it, it does something for you beyond just, just the obvious. That's a great question. And, um, I think I have to come out of my story, right? Like I, my whole backstory is pain, yeah. living, living and, and, and uh, being it, like living on the streets when I started when I was 12. My, my father was not the best guy. We've now become friends. Uh, so alone, uh, you know, drugs, uh, rehab, uh, the confidence of who I was there compared to now is like I live arrived. Like every day I wake up and I've got a long ways to go, but man, I feel like I've arrived. And so I feel like there's, you ask yourself, like I, I've, I've made millions of dollars in real estate investing. I've built companies of, it doesn't do it for me. Like I, I was so egotistical in the way that I just wanted money hardcore. And I feel like that just brought me chaos and broken relationships. Not saying it, like I still go for money, but it's right. different. I have no problem with that. But the thing is, it was just this blind ambition to fill this gap. So I feel like over the years, I've spent so much time on personal growth. I feel like, like I coach people now, I help people, but I, I disguise it as business. And the truth is, if I can help them, when I, when I see someone's life change and I got to be a part of it, I don't say it's because of me. I definitely get to be a part of that. There is nothing like that rush. That's nothing like that feeling. So if we could have a conversation and someone could get impacted, I know it might be fluffy, but this is real for me. I wake up every day of my life and if there's someone I can help, but it's not out of serving what Ben needs. There's just this, I feel very comfortable with who I am more than I've ever felt, but there's this, there is just a reward and a mission that I am on that I can help people believe in themselves. And, and it just happens that I've doubled people's incomes with my coaching over and over and over again, but I go through the back door. It's the right. human being behind it. You know, and, it, and when I look you in the eyes, it's almost like, you know, it's usually, it, we usually find it's, it's, it's whatever they think it is. It's not what it is. Totally it's, it's, true. It's something, it's something internal, and as long as you can pull that out of them, it's exactly right. Yeah, so I think I, 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 think, run, I run into that all the time. That, that's really interesting. 
Yeah, like I think we miss the, the when we talk to coaches, like these people that take these coaching programs, like I'm a coach now, I got certified. That's just because you got sold from a great guy that's, you know, that's leveraging his coaching into the club or something. But I think the biggest thing that can transform people's lives is challenge is to put them, if they're willing to let me or let you show them who they really are. And if they can face that and get to know who they really are, good and bad, some people are insecure and they're, they're down on themselves all the time when they shouldn't be. Some people are way too high on themselves, but the reality is you can get a good accurate view of who you are. Now you could do something with your life. I feel like that comes through like blunt challenge. Like it's not like the, the oh, well, let me encourage you, Tim. Like that doesn't help you. No. What helps you is going, dude, you're being an ass. Why are you being an ass? Let's talk about it. But it comes out of compassion that just right. looks, looks harsh. I find that's uh, my mentors and things have helped me as well that way. And I, I find that's where I find most breakthroughs. I got the balls to say what needs to be said, but it always comes out of, out of love in a way, you know? Yeah, I think, I, think this cult, I think it's dangerous in this culture. I understand, uh, uh, you know, the anti-bullying and all that stuff and the, um, in the, you know, but this idea of, of running away from shame is, mm. I think it's a bad idea. Shame has helped me and more, you know, being, being shamed into doing something be, that you know is the right thing to do is often been the, 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 the catalyst for change for me on that. And I had the right mentor to do it. And he wasn't gentle with me. He wasn't, wasn't harsh yeah. or brutal, but very, would, would not brook any, any you know coddling or anything like that yeah they're not fluffy right they're not it, yeah sometimes we take consideration of our uh the people like i'm a very much take consideration of people feeling I, I i want you to like me and i want you to feel great but when it comes right down to it i'm going to tell the truth if i'll put it all on the table I'll, I'll put the side away i won't be nice but i'll be real and i think that there's a hunger like i spoke in connecticut the other day to 500 agents and uh I spoke about my story and all the, and living on the streets and how that affected my, and how today that still affects my business and stuff. And it was almost like it had a, had a standing ovation. People were lined up for hours just to come talk to me. And every single one was so desperate for real. I just kept it real for real. There's so much packaged bullshit out there. And I think that, I think that's where I feel like if I was to shift this world, it, let's get real. You might not like who you are, but at least you're real now, you know, like yeah, stop pretending. The whole idea of coaching is really weird to me. I, mean, I, I, I coach was somebody who I always had, he came from a place of experience, you know, and, uh, and, and had something that they were really passionate about. Yeah. And to be a coach, just to be a coach. Yeah. And it's it's, so much, it's really, a business now. It, it's a strange, it's a strange thing. I'm not saying, you know, I mean, I have friends in the industry that, that do it. It's just, it's not my thing. But I, I think there's a lack of authenticity if, if you haven't got out there and done something first that you can then come back. And then if you have a real passion, say, geez, I don't want people to have to go through the indirect path that I went. I, I'd really like to coach somebody and, sh and, and share what I learned on how to do this. You know, yeah. and, you, and that's what drives you, that drive to help people. Then I can see it. But I see a lot of people, um, you know, it's, it goes back to what we were, we were talking about before. They don't want to put the time in. They don't want to. Yeah. They don't want really master I got the stripes, man. I got the yeah. stripes. Yeah. Like it, it, like the thing is though, I feel like we run from our pain when we need to embrace it and we gotta, we gotta let it go through that process. Like you just got to go through that process and we need to like so many people run when there's pain. When I use an example of when they're like, if you had a, if you had a broken leg, so take that as an, a wound or emotional wound or whatever, it, let's say you got a, you got hurt really bad. Yeah, it's kind of ironic. It's a great time to chat with your, with your topic, but, yeah. but like, and like you ignore it. You just ignore it and like, no, I'm good. I'm good. Like how many people do that? But after a while it does heal and you feel like it's all good, but you walk with a limp, you limp right. and limp and limp. And eventually you get so freaking tired of that limp. You're like, Hey, I got to deal with this shit. That's been sitting with me forever. Okay. Go to a doctor. Hey, I'm ready to deal with it. And they're like, yeah, it's kind of late. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to have to break that leg again. What? Yeah. You got to open up the wound. You got to go through that bullshit because it's haunting you. You got the limp in your life. So then you got to go through that process of healing and you got to embrace the pain to actually find the healing. And so I feel like pain is something that we run from when I actually think in a weird way, like violence, how we, we, we run from it. It's, it's a lot of the stuff. We just have to embrace that process of pain. And I feel like there's a teacher in it and the faster I can embrace it, the faster I can get through it. That's how I look at it. Yeah. It's getting past the irrational fears that we have because once we know how something operates and works, and even if it's really, you know, 
a difficult situation. Once you understand it, then you're fine. It's when you don't understand yeah. it and you just have these irrational reactions to things. Totally. It's just going to hold you back for so long. That's why you challenge every, like this is why challenge is the way out. You challenge how you think, hey, challenge how you feel. Why did I react that way? Why do I believe that way? I was told to believe this as a kid. Is that mine? Like every single thing gets challenged and then you can actually find kind of like your thing. You find that passion. You find, we're so lost in all that stuff. So, man, this is great, Tim. Yeah, I really enjoyed this. this really, me too. I, I look forward to uh, the next time we connect.